You're watching Keystone Science, and in today's episode, we're going to be building and talking about some properties of the cathode ray tube. So I had told a few of you that this video was going to come out on the Wednesday, that is tomorrow, that is almost today in two hours. But as it turns out, all the footage that I had recorded before for this episode and a couple more were on a corrupted SD card, and there's no way that I can think of to recover it, given all the programs that I've tried on it. So, it's coming out on Thursday, which you know by now. With all that out of the way, let's hope nothing else goes wrong with this video, and let's proceed forward. So this video is intended to be a little bit of a precursor, because we're going to be doing some experiments with the cathode ray tube for the next couple weeks. Um, not the direct next video, but it's going to be coming down the line. And so, I figured I'd introduce you guys to some of the general properties that were discovered early on with the cathode ray tube. Specifically, the kind of cathode ray tube that we're going to be talking about today is called a Crookes tube. It was invented in the late 1800s by a guy named Crookes. So one of the reasons why this tube is so important is that so many scientific discoveries have been hinged off the anomalies it proposed. So for instance, the discovery of the electron, which was done by J.J. Thompson in the late 1800s as well, used the cathode ray tube to discover it, as well as the first Nobel Prize, which was given to Röntgen for his discovery of x-rays, which were given off due to his experiments with the cathode ray tube, and the seventh Nobel Prize, which was given to Philip Leonard for his innovations on the cathode ray tube. So needless to say, this device has quite a rich history in scientific discovery. And seeing as it was just Thanksgiving, which for you non-American viewers is a holiday that you have food, I took it upon myself to grab quite a few of these bottles from everyone. So yeah, we're gonna be using some of these. Now, for legality reasons, I have to advise that you don't try this experiment at home. In all seriousness, though, this can be quite dangerous, because we are subjecting one of these to a vacuum, which can cause it to implode, especially since I had to drill a hole in it. I could have damaged the structural integrity of the bottle, which is not all that good. And also, this uh, experiment does produce x-rays, and this is definitely not a x-ray absorbent material here, or any dense material that would even nearly block out the x-rays. So, I will essentially be radiating myself but only in small quantities, because I'm not going to leave it on for that long. So, yeah. To achieve the vacuum, I'm going to be using this vacuum pump. Now, most vacuum pumps are actually quite expensive. However, in a previous video, I showed you guys how to turn a refrigerator's compressor into a vacuum pump. And as it turns out, the vacuum it can achieve is great enough to achieve cathode rays. So if you want to learn how to make this vacuum pump, then I'll go ahead and leave a link in the description to that video, and you can watch it. It's extremely simple, and you can have yourself a cheap vacuum pump. Now here we have the tube we constructed for the cathode ray. Now you may notice that the entrance here is a little bit slightly crooked, and that's because last time I was running it, I believe it heated up so much that it started melting the epoxy. And so I have heard on the internet that a better thing to use would be something like JV Weld, because that does not melt under such low pressure, and especially because the melting can often cause it to open up and then destroy your vacuum that you have essentially here, which then destroys the cathode ray and you have to reseal it up and wait a while, as I've done many times before. On this end is going to be our cathode, so we're going to connect up the negative to this end, while on this end over here is going to be our anode, so where we connect up the high voltage positive. And of course this valve is just sealed off going over to the vacuum pump so that it can achieve the vacuum inside the chamber. Now over here we have our admittedly pretty ghetto power supply. Now we did build this in a previous episode, actually it was even to power an old arc glove that I was using. Um, but if you want to learn how to build this, I will have that linked in the description below. It's a pretty easy circuit to just follow along and have a very, very good high voltage power supply. In fact, this power supply is actually quite dangerous, so you have to be really careful with it because it outputs anywhere from 0 to 36,000 volts and accompanied with that, it's pretty high current as well. So you really gotta watch out for this guy. And so now I have the vacuum pump running alongside the power supply, and so eventually we should start seeing little streamers come off of that uh, anode there and cathode, and yeah, from there we should eventually see the effects we're looking for. Whoa. Okay. As you can see, it just barely got over, and you can see the striations. I have it turned down to 23,000 volts right now. I'm going to go ahead and get close to it with this magnet, and you can see, as I do, it is definitely affecting it. So if you look inside of here, we can actually see these dark bands followed by these bright bands. Now this is really interesting, because what's happening here is that the electron is being accelerated within the electric field, so essentially it's being accelerated by the voltage potential between the cathode over here and the anode, that high voltage that we have there, which is right now 21,700 volts. And as it does that, eventually it reaches a certain energy level, where if it collides with an atom, it then ionizes that atom, 
which then that atom, when it drops back down to a ground state level, will emit the energy as radiation towards us. And then after that, it acts as a break for the electron because the energy is now gone, so it slows back down, which is where we see the dark bands, but then very, very quickly, the electric field re-accelerates it back up to an ionizing energy. So now we can note that right here at 21,000 volts, we have approximately one, two, three, four, and a little bit of one of the striation patterns occurring where the electron is being accelerated and then accelerated again and then accelerated again before it crashes down here into the anode. Now, watch as I turn it up to 32,000 volts. As I do this, you can see not only do the number of striations increase, but also the prominence of them. This is because the number of electrons that are traveling through the tube, or the current essentially, went up, as well as the ability for the electron to accelerate quicker. That also went up, so therefore the electron is ready to ionize quicker, and I am going to turn this down because you can see little sparks there coming off the end, and I do not want it to implode on me. So let's turn it just down to a nice stream like this. Oh, that was kind of interesting. Another thing interesting about the cathode ray to note that we'll be testing and examining more in detail in future videos, but as I bring the voltage down to approximately 12,000 volts, or even there, you can see it there for a second, let me show you guys again, you can see that near the cathode, or even right here, you can see near the cathode we get a dark spot, while everywhere else is bright. And let me bring it further down to show you guys a little bit better. Like there, you can see it very well for a second. Um, what that dark space is actually called is Crook's dark spot, and the reasoning and why it exists we will be getting into in a future video, so don't you worry. I just wanted to show you guys that, because I think it's quite interesting. Let me show you guys one more time. There we go. Now I should probably turn this off before it melts, because you can see here that the copper on the end of the cathode is getting extremely hot. That's because I probably used too thin of a wire on this, and so... I'm going to go ahead and shut this off and move on over to a different cathode ray tube that we can use to further examine some of the effects that it has available to us. So admittedly, this next tube is probably one that a lot more of you are familiar with, or at least have interacted with. Now this tube here actually came out of an old CRT TV, which by the way stands for cathode ray tube television, so that's pretty neat. But the specific advantages this one has is that the end here is coated in phosphorus, so that when it goes past the anode down here, which is uh, probably this rim about right here, and the cathode is up here, when it goes past that anode, um, some electrons that do not quite stick to the anode, they continue flying, they run into this phosphorescent coating, which is probably something like zinc oxide or something like that. Uh, this specifically has a color blue, so I'm not exactly sure which uh, material emits that. But anyways, when the electron smashes into here, it emits it as visible light, and so we can see a precise dot from where the electron hit, which is pretty neat for doing experiments with. Now as I'm going to demonstrate to you, the path of an electron can be manipulated by electric fields, and also by magnetic fields. And so essentially, these aspects of an electron's path were exploited by Philo T. Farnsworth when he invented the first television. Now his innovation was to essentially take a tube with a phosphorescent coating, and go ahead and place on some coils like this down on the end of it. And so what would happen is that using the magnetic fields generated by the coils, you are able to direct the electron to where you want, and you can vary the high voltage across it to change the intensity of the electron. And so, with these properties, if I scan back and forth very, very quickly, faster than any human eye can notice, then you get what looks like a coherent image. So yeah, that's enough jargon for this guy. I'm gonna go ahead and connect him up to my power supply so we can do some experiments with it. So now with our tube running, and with us able to see exactly where the electron's hitting down here on the end of the screen, let me go ahead and bring the north side of a magnet down upon the top of the tube. And as I do so, we can observe that the electron moves in that direction. So in other words, by breaking the magnet near, I'm bending the path of the electron in that way. Similarly now with the south side of the magnet, you can see as I bring it down upon the top of the tube, we get the electron moving, in that direction, so directly opposite to the way that the north side is bringing it. Now this magnetic force upon the electron has to do with the vector components of both the magnetic force and the path of the electron. However, a much more easier way to think about it is something called the left-hand rule. What this rule essentially states is that if we line up our thumb with the current, and our middle finger towards the B-field, specifically towards the north-seeking pole, and so, when we put them in that orientation, we note that our index finger is the direction that force is enacted upon the charged particle. So now for our next test, on the end of this wooden stick I have this very positively charged plate. If you're curious how I did this, I simply attached this as one end of a capacitor, and then when I got the capacitor all charged up, I simply separated them, and this had a very high voltage on it. And so, this was the positive side, and so it's extremely positively charged. And so, I'm going to bring it down on top of the tube, as we were doing with the magnet, to observe what happens. Okay, now I'm going to start lowering this very positively charged plate down upon the top of the cathode ray tube. Almost arced over, I could hear it. So as you look at the path of the electron, you can actually see that it is being 
bent up, as we would expect, because the charge carrier inside of this is inherently negative, and this is positive, so the electron is being attracted to this plate, and as we see on the screen here, it is being bent upwards. Similarly now, I've gone back and attached quite a negative charge up to this plate, and so, as expected, when I bring it close, the electrons are getting repelled, and thus we see the path going downward. Now as you can see, on the back of the tube, I've connected back up the coils that would create the magnetic field that would drive the electron back and forth within the television. And, connected to those coils, I have a function generator. And so now, when I turn on that function generator, you can see that the dot moves back and forth to the frequency I selected. And so, let's turn that a little bit higher. It becomes very quick to not be able to see anymore. There we go. Right there you can see it jotting back and forth. And it only goes a little bit, since I'm not really driving that much current through those coils, so therefore it's not deflecting it that far. Rather than the sine wave I was using before, here I'm using a square wave to drive the beam of electrons, which, you can see, is going back and forth much more instantaneously than the sine wave was. Now, although I can't fit it into this video, we're going to be doing an experiment in a couple weeks where I will show you guys that we can calculate the mass-to-charge ratio of an electron by noting the deflection due to the electric field and the deflection due to the magnetic field and putting them in a ratio together. And so that'll be pretty exciting. However, it's getting really late where I am, and this shed is getting really cold, and so that's going to do it for this video. Hopefully you guys were able to learn some of the intrinsic properties of cathode rays, because they really are such interesting things, and I think they're really quite beautiful in person, and hopefully the camera does it justice. If you'd like to see some of the experiments I'm going to be doing in the future with not only the cathode ray tube, but many other things, then go ahead and hit that subscribe button so they'll show up in your subscription newsfeed. And if you enjoyed this video or learned something new, I'd really appreciate it if you'd hit the thumbs up button, as it really does help the channel quite a bit. If you have a suggestion for a physics topic or experiment that you'd like to see me cover in the future, then go ahead and leave it in the comment section below and I'll try to get back to you. As well as, you guys should really check out this channel's Discord server. Not only is it run by really good people, like, really, I highly recommend them, I think they're all great, but also, it's a lot of like-minded people, and they can give you help on plenty of questions that you'd have about circuits, physics, or whatever have you. And so, you guys should head over there and make some friends, and I really love actually reading what you guys write through there. Even though I don't get on all that much, I still really do love it, and I'll try to get on more in the future to help you guys out and just talk to you guys. Well, that just about does it for this video. I uh, probably don't replicate this experiment unless you want a higher chance of cancer and other disfigurements, which are generally considered bad things. So, with that in mind, please remember to be safe and have a wonderful day. See you guys next time. You're watching Keystone Science, and in today's episode, we're going to show you how to make your very own solar panel.